What's up, freaks? This rip was brought to you by River. River's a Bitcoin company built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners the right way. There's no trusted third parties. They build all their infrastructure. They have free DCA because they know it's the best way to buy Bitcoin. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you want to mine Bitcoin, you want to send Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, you want to plug into their Lightning Network API. If you're a developer, they're building all these tools for you. They also encourage self-custody. Again, they're Bitcoiners. They want to provide an on-ramp for you and then teach you and encourage you to take control of your own Bitcoin. And they're doing this. It's a beautiful company. If you do hold Bitcoin on the exchange, you can know for sure, since they don't rely on any third parties, they don't lend your Bitcoin out, they don't speculate with your Bitcoin, your Bitcoin is held in a multi-sig wallet with 100% reserves. Okay, so go to river.com slash TFTC, take advantage of the no fee DCA, you set up your dollar cost average, you don't pay any fees on those buys. If you're a developer, they have their Lightning Network Services API that you can build on, you can send over Lightning, you can mine via river as well uh, you may have your exchange you may be comfortable with it but if you have you tried river yet it's a question you have to ask yourself if the answer is no go try it that's where all the bitcoiners are hanging out that's where i get my bitcoin as well river.com slash tftc thank you guys for listening if you're listening on youtube please subscribe set the notifications up as well we're going to be putting out a lot of content this year uh, if you want to Subscribe to the podcast feed as well. If you're not around your computer or not listening on YouTube, but you want to catch the podcast on the podcasting feeds, subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And if you want to learn more about Bitcoin, I write a, a newsletter almost daily during the week. Go to tftc.io, subscribe on the website, and you'll get pure signal on Bitcoin, macroeconomics, geopolitics, whatever tickles my fancy that day. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for supporting the show. If you can subscribe, rate, review, it goes a long way. We're trying to blow this up in 2023. Enjoy the rip. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. When you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. I'm ready to uh, look, look, look. I'm gonna start, start <laughs> out the podcast by stumbling through my words. I was going to say, I'm ready to flow. Uh, I'm being inspired by your flow. You're, you've grown uh, yeah. your hair out. I have, yeah. You got to, as a Bitcoiner, you got to keep people guessing. You can't look the same all the time, right? Yeah. I'm that way. I'll grow my beard out for like three weeks and I'll shave it. Yeah. I actually had yeah. a moment, uh, a shave two days ago and my seven month old son didn't recognize me. Oh yeah. I scared the crap out of him. Yeah. That's all. That's always fun. Scaring your kids when you get yeah. a drastic, <laughs> drastic change in your looks. Um, I say that then I like wear like a voltage, like sweatshirt and it kind of doxes me, but, um, Yeah. Uh, you gotta keep it, keep them guessing. It's good merch. It's a good crew neck. Yeah, thank you. I can't believe it's been two years since you've been on. I know. That's what I was thinking. The same thing. I was I was kind of reflecting on the last time I was on, and when I was the last time that I came on TFCC about two years ago, uh, I I hadn't even I was I had launched Voltage, but I wasn't working on it full time. I had a day job, and I was like actually really nervous about coming on the podcast. Of like, oh, it's my day job. I'm gonna find out. Are they gonna be mad? Like those kinds of things, and. Um, but I mean, we did it, and yeah, it was a great rip, and now we're gonna gonna do it again. What? Uh, when did you leave your day job officially? It would have been February of 2021. So I'm coming up on two years full time with Voltage. Yeah, you guys have come a long way. Yeah, I mean, it's been a been a wild ride uh, for us, for the network, for Bitcoin as a whole. I mean, um, time moves fast in Bitcoin. It's really crazy. Yeah, there's a lot of guys leveraging you. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. want to. I'm not gonna dox who I was speaking to this morning, but I was. I had a call with somebody this morning. They're like, yeah, we're using voltages or back end. It seems like that's becoming more commonplace in the space. Yeah, I mean, we've we've been really fortunate. I mean, things have gone really well. I think that um, it speaks to the to the need of a service like voltage in, in the market. And so um, 
yeah, I mean, it's been really great. And it's been really, uh, that's been one of the funnest things about doing this is working with other Bitcoiners, right? Like it's not, um, I'm not, we're not pushing, you know, some crappy software that I don't really care about. It's like, you know, we're pushing Bitcoin, we're pushing lightning and working with, you know, some of the, some of the best people in the space. And it's just, that's, that's really, really fun. Yeah. And so for any of the freaks out there who may be listening now, who are newer to TFTC may not have heard our first rip in 2021 or be mm -hmm. aware of what voltage is, what are you guys doing? Why are you doing it? Yeah, so uh, so what Voltage is, we're a Bitcoin infrastructure provider. So we just help companies and individuals um, run infrastructure for Bitcoin and Lightning, obviously, right? But that comes down to uh, mainly Lightning nodes. Lightning is our kind of uh, cornerstone product. So we help um, with hosting, running Lightning nodes. We help with uh, liquidity management. We help with observability. Um, and then we also do some things inside of like layer one, Bitcoin two, of just kind of operating Bitcoin nodes and things like that as well. So ultimately, you know, Lightning is complex. Complex. There's a lot to it, and there's a lot of people that want to leverage the technology, but there's honestly very few people that have kind of the technical chops to like do it all yourself all the time. And so, you know, that's where we come in. We help people, uh, you know, understand the technology and ultimately, you know, implement it into their businesses or, or what they're doing. Yeah. So you guys, I mean, I guess you have three products. Then in offering, you have the managed node service, you have Flow, you have Surge, and then. You've integrated BTC Pay server as well, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we do. Um, ultimately, you know, we try and hit on kind of like the high points of, you know, one hosting um, of nodes. We also help people like actually operate them, like understand, you know, we have a lot of customers that are uh, kind of from like the fiat space or like, you know, they come to Bitcoin um, not knowing a ton about Lightning. And so we help them understand what is liquidity, how do you how do you use it, those kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, e-commerce solutions like BTC Pay server uh, and then, you know, Surge. So we're, we're trying to create a platform that really helps people, you know, just use lightning more simply and whether, you know, we're, we're working on doing more, uh, outside of just hosting as well. So, you know, you could still host your node, but we can still help you with that liquidity or the observability or whatever. So, um, a lot of problems to solve ultimately. And we're just trying to, you know, uh, listen to our users and just solve what, you know, what needs to be done. Yeah. I had Rick from crypto cloaks mm -hmm. on yesterday and we were talking about because we both use BTC Pay server, and just from, I like to uh, I'm not an old dog. I can't learn new tricks. I just <laughs> when I set something up, it gets set in my ways. We set our BTC Pay server and our Lightning Node up in May of 2019 mm -hmm. for our site and for the business, and it's been running ever since. I have a CTO who manages it all, but there's like some things that I want as somebody who operates. A company on a Bitcoin standard mm -hmm. and that BTC pay server doesn't have um, and that I imagine it's something that you're building out something like surge is like I need especially for on chain when I'm receiving Bitcoin via my BTC mm -hmm. pay server we have our donation page and make it send a like dollar five dollars twenty dollars a hundred dollars somebody put input your own amount mm -hmm. we've received five hundred dollar donations and so we have all these UTXOs and BTCP server is incredible. I love it. It's my favorite open source project in the space. But as a lazy business owner, like I, I fall behind sometimes. Like, oh, maybe mm -hmm. I should consolidate these UTXs. Like, maybe I would love a software that just pings me and says, "Hey, fee market's relatively low. You have these UTXOs that add up to over ten million sats. Maybe you might want to consolidate them." Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's. Um yeah, that's something that, you know, Surge will either like solve today or eventually solve. But that's ultimately, I think, you know, what you just described boils down to there's uh, kind of a big uh, uh, difference in like the the more the more self-sovereign you are, the more that you want to, you know, BTC pay server generates a new uh, address for every single invoice, which is good for privacy, good for, you know, decorrelating um, activity, things like that. But the more that you push down that route, kind of the harder it is of like, oh, I got all these addresses to manage now. Or same with lightning of, you know, the more, the more uh, private or sovereign you want to do, the more responsibility you have, which is all like great things. Those are all great options to have. Um, but there's not a lot I think there's still a ways to go in like tooling to help you um, be still like sovereign and private and all these things, but still um, not make you just do everything on your own from scratch every single time. Yeah. Well, I mean, we told the story yesterday too, but that was like the biggest holy shit moment of my life was plugging in the hardware wallet associated with my BTC pay server and seeing on my BTC pay server, you have X amount of Bitcoin. I plug in the 
wallet and says you have zero bitcoin i had no idea what a gap table <laughs> was and i was like what, yeah. what the hell is going on here yeah yeah oh we've we've heard that a lot a lot and there's also like it's um you know certain wallet softwares uh don't don't do the like they don't let the gap limit be configurable or they don't like let you set the derivation path or anything like that and so we've we've had customers just really freaking out um about you know, oh, my Bitcoin's gone when it's just like, no, you need to, you know, adjust these settings or something. And so that's a, that's definitely a friction point that like we, we uh, need to work on us all better as well as like the community as a whole, yeah. um, really uh, helping people understand the technology and, you know, just make it, make it dead simple. Yeah. And so over the last two years, since you've dedicated your life to this full time, I mean, Voltage and the Lightning Network have sort of grown in parallel and tandem like to a pretty enormous levels like what's it been mm -hmm. like building voltage particularly focused on customers who want to leverage the lightning network but don't want to manage it um as the lightning network has grown and changed over the last 24 months yeah i mean it's both both voltage and the lightning have changed a lot since i started like when i started voltage um there's like ellen like th there most of the implementations existed except for LDK. LDK wasn't a thing then. Um, and, but L L and D was even had more of the share of the network than it does today. Um, and so, and like things like VLS didn't exist. Like there is a lot of, you know, it was very kind of straightforward um, in terms of what you could do inside of the network. But now um, as you look across the network with things like LDK and, you know, all of the VLS, like all of these other new technologies that have come out, um, you can do a lot more inside of the network, create new experiences, create new things um, that just weren't really possible before, or at least it was really, really difficult. And so um, that's something that has been, we've, that's something that I do as kind of like running voltages. Like, you know, I really try not to have opinions on way things should be or what, you know, how the network should look or uh, play out because that's something that I've really learned is that, you know, there's technology is still progressing. There's still things that are being created uh, today that didn't exist yesterday. And ultimately we just got to listen to users and, you know, understand what they want and how we're going to solve it. And so um, there's a lot of technology uh, that are, that is evolving um, that really just creates new possibilities inside, inside of lightning. And so that's something that I focus a lot of, about is not, um, you know, through these last two years, learning a lot of like the light network that exists today is completely different than what existed two years ago in terms of, you know, capacity, node count, all of these different things. Um, and ultimately I think that, you know, the light network that we see in two years from today is going to be vastly different again. And I think that that's just par for the course of like innovation and technology. And, um, you know, that's something that we focus on a lot at voltage is like, you know, um, solving these problems that need to be solved at the right time. And that also goes into, um, you know, there's some people, there's, because some companies like projects out there that are like, you know, creating these, uh, I would call them like utopian projects of like, you know, when the world is on a Bitcoin standard, everyone's going to need this. And like, those are great. Like, those are really good tools. But, you know, for us, we're very pragmatic of like, how can we get the next, you know, thousand people to start using Bitcoin tomorrow and then the thousand next day and thousand next day. And like, what are their pain points? How do we solve them? And so we're, we take a very pragmatic approach on like developing out the network. Mm -hmm. And so what have, in terms of like Lightning Network specifically, what are the strides it's made in your mind? Like what are some of the biggest updates or changes that have happened over the last two years that have really made it better and given it the ability to, to reach a commercial user base? And then on top of that, as that success has happened, as always happens with Bitcoin and Lightning, you, you fix some things, you grow, and then you find new problems. What are some mm -hmm. of the, the new problems that are arising that you're seeing as well? Well, I think, yeah, I think one of the big, this may be not like enterprise adoption type, but like one, something that we have learned a lot since, you know, two years ago or so is like privacy inside of the light network. Like what, you know, two years ago, I think everyone just kind of thought light networks private didn't really dig in much. It was just kind of like, sure. And then now we have people um, that are kind of recent, that are more dedicated into like the privacy aspects of lightning and learning, you know, what is private, what isn't private, where do we have more to work to do inside of the privacy aspects of lightning. And there's still significantly amount, you know, more amount of work to do there. Um, and then same thing with kind of, um, adversarial like aspects of the network. So things like, you know, channel jamming or um, there's a few like kind of known attack vectors out there and working through um, mitigating those, uh, which are not, not necessarily easy problems to solve, but 
as we look for, you know, forward, I think solving a lot of those kind of like privacy and scalability issues are really going to be um, at the forefront of people's minds as well as voltage and uh, trying to solve those in really, really good ways. And, um, you know, I don't, there's not necessarily an exact answer on what that is. There's a lot of ideas, a lot of proposals on how to solve each and every one of them. Um, but I think that that is what, you know, we've had a lot of great success in onboarding across the network, across of, you know, organizations like Cash App wasn't using Lightning two years ago. And like Cash App, you know, ginam, ginormous financial institution, they're, they're incorporated Lightning. Um, and so uh, it hasn't necessarily been a hindrance in adoption, but as we move forward, I think that uh, as we onboard more and more people of, to, that, to that magnitude, we're gonna have to really start looking at some of these like scalability, like um, attack vectors and privacy and things like that. Yeah, and that's always been the big question in regards to Lightning specifically. I mean, it was derided as this just fun project that Bitcoiners are playing with. It would mm -hmm. never be scalable. Here we are. When was it launched? 2018? Um, yeah. Beginning of 2018, so here we are almost five years later. It has reached significant adoption, obviously not mass adoption, but it's made significant strides. Do you still worry... Is there any lingering thoughts in your back of your mind like, hey, this Lightning Network could fail to scale or provide the utility that, that Bitcoiners think it can? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think, um, so I don't, I don't really have that doubt in my mind. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I think that um, one, again, going back to like, you know, the, the, the advances we've made since two years ago to now are significant. And like, you know, it's e easy for us to sit here today and say, you know, we got so much more work to do. Look at the mountain we have to climb. But you need to look back and like look at where have we come from so far, and like it's significant. So we need to kind of um, take it, you know, take it all in at once. Um, and then additionally, like with a lot of the technology improvements that are happening, I think that there's uh, increased opportunity for more uh, more adoption, more ease of use. And I think that um, so a couple of things, like a lot of, uh, I think the Lightning Network is a lot larger than a lot of people on Twitter like to think like I think the amount of like private channels is more significant than you know what people think I think the um, amount of people that are actually looking at the space and like working on things like behind the scenes is more significant so I think that um, the hard the hard part is quantifying the lightning network today is really comes down to like you know the node count the channel count the channel capacity like those are like the three public metrics that we have for the light network but ultimately those aren't really great metrics like those aren't good at actually quantifying is this thing working or not you know those metrics are more about like you know there's a whole private channel like aspects or unannounced channels and there's also like you know the more important metrics are like the throughput of how many transactions are being you know sent across this what is like the cumulative value of those and those are inherently private like those will never really be known you know the only way is like people self-reporting um, and so I think that I think we've come a long way and I think it's easy for people to kind of um, point to these lacking metrics and say oh it's not but they're lacking metrics like they're not great and um and then also, I think that, you know, something that we're hyper focused on at Voltage is like, you know, solving things like non-custodially or trying to push as much um, ownership or ejectability to a user. And so I think if, you know, if we look at the Lightning Network and it's this grandiose layer two solution that's supposed to scale Bitcoin, but if it's so difficult to you, the only the, so difficult to use, the only way to use it is through custodians, we failed. Like that's just straight up like. You know, we just reinvented Visa and we're going to go back to censorship. We're going to go back to like, you know, a uh, uh, seizure, all of these things. And so um, that is something that we're focused on is making sure that we can um, adjust the or uh, innovate the technology to get us to where we can still do things non-custodially and still give ownership to people, but make it as easy as these custodial solutions that everyone's kind of um, that are, I would say, a majority of users are custodial today. And so really shifting that narrative and if, if we're custodial and lightning, like it's just kind of all mute. So you mentioned VLS a couple of times earlier in the conversation. Does that mm -hmm. play into this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that's something that we're, uh, we're like kind of looking at and figuring out ways of, of incorporating into and just to give a quick explainer on VLS, VLS is like validating lightning signer. It's kind of a, a policy engine that lets um, a user set uh, policies on kind of what's happening inside of their lightning node. And then along with that, usually they kind of go in tandem as like remote keys. So being able to sign, you know, transactions from, you know, your phone or uh, a hardware wallet or anything like that. And so there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but like ultimately innovations like that and, um, you know, 
easier liquidity. There's kind of a laundry list of things that we can do to improve the user experience of Lightning to the point where uh, it's as easy as custodial, but you still have, you know, you still own the keys, you can still, you know, control your funds, do all those things. Yeah. And Paul Atoy teased this a few months ago that, that he had made a breakthrough in the VLS technology. So another way to describe it, right, is you're separating the private key from the node infrastructure. So ideally, who knows how it plays out in the long run, short term, medium run, whatever it is. But I think ideally, in my mind, if you're able to give end users the private key, who, like maybe it sits on a Star9 Labs embassy, maybe it sits on your computer, maybe you have just like a, a dedicated Wi-Fi enabled USB device that you can plug into your wall and you have the private key and you say, hey, you can sign all the transactions associated with this node. And then somebody like Voltage takes on the heavy lifting actually managing the node, but you guys have no control over the funds. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And there's a, like, there's, there's a lot even to go beyond that of like, um, things that aren't possible in lightning today, but are, uh, maybe being worked on or, or possible are like multi-sig lightning, um, and things like that, which, you know, takes some, um, iteration on like the, the spec and, and some of those things. But like, ultimately there's a lot of opportunity to like kind of push, uh, push those types of things forward. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately either um, having more robust, you know, um, signing mechanisms or um, key distribution and things like that. Um, so I think that there's, I, th I have a feeling this year is going to push a lot, um, a lot of innovation in that direction. I know that people like the LDK team um, are focused on a lot of those kinds of um, those types of solutions. So I think there's a, a lot of work to be done in that, in that realm. Yeah, which brings us to a spicy part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Lightning Network implementations, do you have a favorite? A favorite? Or, or, well, any, or any surprising you? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So I, I think that um, L&D, so like we, you know, us at Voltage, like we obviously, you know, being a hosting provider, we have touched every single implementation. We've probably used it more than, than most people of each one. And so um, we have a lot of experience kind of across the board. And I think that each one is kind of well-suited for, specific tasks. So if you're trying to build out kind of more um, mobile wallet experiences, LDK is definitely like the one to go with. If you're trying to do a more kind of enterprise, like large scale node for a custodial service or something like LND is definitely still like the winner there. Um, Core Lightning um, is coming up and has a little bit more, uh, you know, some opportunity in some of like the scalability aspects. So it's like, and that's something we work with our customers on is like understanding their use case and figuring out which one fits into what they want to do. And so I wouldn't say that I won't, I won't say that I have a favorite. I, will, I won't, you know, I, I don't want to go to on that path, but um, uh, I think they all have like unique opportunities to solve problems um, in their own ways. Uh, and so I think uh, it, it comes down to what you want to do. And I also think that, you know, there's a lot of um, innovation happening inside of like mutiny. So you talked with, uh, with Paul, um, uh, Paul Miller, like, a, you know, it was several months back or something, I think, and he talked a little bit about mutiny. So that's like a, a very privacy centric wallet that's built using LDK. And so I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity for kind of new implementations or kind of new things to be built uh, alongside those two. And I think that, I think that ultimately um, there will be more implementations and I think that they will be more focused in a particular direction of like the most private one or the most scalable one or the most, you know, configurable. And so I think there's again, a lot of opportunity in that space. That's not a bad outcome. Give people optionality. Yeah. And that yeah. goes back to, I mean, what you're saying about there not being very good metrics on the space for the Lightning Network, and even saying that the Lightning Network is a bit of a misnomer because via these different implementations or just via sub-networks that you can build in Lightning, there's multiple mm -hmm. Lightning, there could be multiple Lightning Networks in the yeah. future. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And I think that that's, um, I can't remember who kind of had the idea, but like, I think that... Um, as we see a lot um, more things come out of like either surveillance tech or like custodial services or whatever, I think that people kind of, some people have the idea of like these two lightning networks. One of them is kind of like a highly regulated, like um, yeah, highly regulated like environment. The other one is like more, um, you know, pleb focus, more private, all those things. And um, I think it, it's a possible outcome. That's what is so great about the lightning network in general is that you have that option. Like there's not, um, Lightning not being a consensus layer allows you to do things like me and you could have a Lightning channel. We That's all that we have. It's just me and you. We only transact with each other and that's it. And that could, that's its own Lightning network in a way. And I think that um, there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, 
you can pick and choose. Do you want to operate in this regulated one? Do you want to operate in this, you know, less regulated one? Or like, in, where do you want to go with it? And um, <laughs> so I think that that's like a really exciting um, benefit to Lightning as well is the ability to really pick and choose how you want to interact with it. Yeah. And then you can even imagine a future in which like particular companies or services that don't want to risk something like a channel jamming attack on the more, the broader network will create just sub networks or themselves and their customers and they can sort of isolate and work within that, that circular economy of, of the, of a company and its customers and then mm-hmm. maybe interact with the broader lightning network uh, very few times. Yeah, I mean, we've we've definitely seen that kind of uh, play out in some ways of like some of the larger financial institutions have to have like legal contracts with like their channel partners because they're, you know, afraid of, oh, if there's a bug in the technology or if, yeah, like uh, you aren't going to attack me or something like that. And so they, um, until maybe some of those problems are better solved, they have just like legal contracts um, to kind of like have a, you know, a binding agreement that one's not going to mess with the other. Um, And so I think that, uh, and, and maybe even solving those kind of channel jamming attacks and things like that. There is probably always um, situations where you only want to have channel partners that you trust or um, there's less just kind of opening up into random nodes. And so um, there's a, and, and it, that also kind of comes down to personal strategy on what you want to do. Um, do you want to just open up channels into random places or do you want to be more pragmatic about it? And so, um, again, it's optionality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh. What are your thoughts on, I mean, this is a bit random. It doesn't really build on that part of the discussion, but it's nagging in my head. I want to talk about it. Are you paying attention to the potential transition from HDLCs to PTLCs for channel events? I personally haven't been very, uh, I haven't followed that kind of dialogue much. Um, I think some of our engineers, I'm sure, are um, closer to uh, closer to that conversation. Um, me, I just, you know, I'm, uh, again, it kind of goes back to having an objective view of like the network of like, you know, whatever uh, the kind of the people that are looking at the protocol that think is best and like most scalable and solves like these problems, like, you know, I'm all for it. And so, um, and then we at Voltage just kind of digest things as they become ready and available to use. And so uh, that's kind of the way that I think about PTLCs as well as, you know, it sounds great. Like, let you know, let's go for it. And uh, when it's ready, we'll start looking at, you know, how can we incorporate this? How can we um, upgrade or whatever? Uh, so so that, that's kind of my take on it. It's not a very good answer because I don't follow like the, the I try and follow as much technical things as I can, but there's only so much that you can follow. Yeah, there's so much <laughs> out there. And that's one thing because I, I mean, in an ideal world, PTLCs, they seem better from a privacy perspective, from mm-hmm. uh, extendability perspective on what you can do within those channels. But it seems like uh, so for the like, hash time lock contracts or how you open up a, a channel with a counterparty on Lightning right now, there's a pro- not a proposal, but there ideally uh, there's a more optimal way to open up these these time lock contracts, which is point time lock contracts, PTLCs, and a lot of the Lightning developers would like to transition to that. But you you have this thing where the Lightning network's growing massively and people are using it and it's getting usability. Um, and even though PTLCs may be uh, more optimal than HDLCs, there's potential that the network just grows so large before anybody makes that transition that it would be somewhat of a logistical nightmare to close all those HDLCs and reopen PTLCs. Yeah, yeah. and I think um, I think that there is maybe... I could be wrong on this, so I probably shouldn't say it, but I'm going to. But I think that uh, I think there's like people working on ways of like trying to upgrade channels like to support like PTLCs without having to close them. But like I, I don't really know what the I think Lalo is working on it. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think that there could be a path forward with that. But I think ultimately, like what this is another reason to be bullish on Lightning is that there's you know the network that exists today isn't the network that's going to exist tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Like there's so much. Thing, there's so much that we know that we can do and evolve with it that it's it's just mind boggling. And I think that, you know, ultimately a lot of that just kind of, you know, there's coordination across all these different teams and stuff like that, but it's really like kind of a, a manpower issue of like, you know, if we had, not saying we had 10X the developers inside of Lightning, like, you know, it would be, we would be in a utopian place right now. But I think that there is a significant amount um, 
that can be done if we just had some more people working on it, that we can um, advance things further. And so I think that um, that's one, like a call to action for anyone that's interested in this space. I mean, definitely get interested because there's just, there is a lot to be done like across the board. There's so much work to be done. And that also is a reason to be bullish because, you know, there's, um, you know, the network that exists today is just a small fraction of what it will be in the future. Yeah. It's the, I mean, could not co-sign that any harder. The opportunity is massive. If you want to come innovate and leave your mark on the world, mm -hmm. not only lightning, like design for lightning yeah. apps, design for on-chain protocol apps, like just the whole space is wide open. It's extremely exciting. And you're on, you're on the cutting edge of, of changing the world and then the global monetary system. So why wouldn't yeah. you want to come work on it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think like that's that's what's a big difference between, you know, when I started Voltage and, and today is there there used to not be that many like opportunities to contribute to Bitcoin besides being a software engineer. And, like that was kind of that was what anyone that wanted to get in Bitcoin, you had to be a software engineer. Now today, that's totally not true. Yeah, I mean, there's so many good Bitcoin companies out there and they hire across the board designers like, you know, sales, whatever. Like there's just tons of opportunity. You guys have impeccable design, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you. Very beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that. We've uh, yeah, we've done a lot of work. We have, you know, some great designers um, and, you know, Bobby, our VP of marketing does a great job on kind of um, kind of coordinating a lot of that stuff. So, yeah, we appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, it's very pretty. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. And a good UX as well. Intuitive. Um, with that being said, like, what are, what are some of the like the main lessons you've learned from interacting with your growing list of customers over the last year? Is there anything uh, dealing with a particular customer that really showed you, huh, I, I didn't recognize this before. Um, and this is something interesting that I'm learning from dealing with people in the unique ways in which they want to leverage lightning. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been a lot, there's been a lot of, uh, kind of like lessons learned. And I think, um, so like one of the big, one of the big things that we've seen really recently is there's a lot of people coming to us that are not, um, not Bitcoin focused people. So like we have a lot of like Bitcoin companies that use us that are, you know, they understand Bitcoin, Bitcoin native, all of those things. But we were seeing an increase in the amount of um, non Bitcoin centric companies. So these are people like traditional fiat payment processors that understand that Bitcoin and the Lightning Network is a superior means of moving money around the world. And they understand that uh, they need to leverage the technology or be left behind. And so they are, you know, coming to us looking for solutions on like, you know, hey, we need to start looking at our plans for Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. And, you know, we help them through that. And so that has also been a huge eye opener in terms of, you know, what is, what are the UX problems inside of Lightning? You know, you can talk with a, a pleb all day on like, you know, why, what do you need to do with a channel? But then you go to some, traditional fiat payment processor and they're like why the hell do i need to what is a channel why do i need to have liquidity like can i just like send something um and so it, so that's been a big just kind of eye opener in just in terms of like the ux but it's also i think that that sentiment of those types of people coming to us is is again super bullish for the network of like people are waking up to the fact that if you want to you know send money internationally or locally even the means of sending over the light network is superior to anything else. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's all of these things. And people are waking up to that and they're trying to understand what their strategy is for it. And so, you know, along with that, there's a huge amount of um, things that we learn and we get insights into on people that want to leverage the technology, but they aren't coming up from a, from a Bitcoin perspective. They're coming at it from, I need to use this to save my business X dollars or whatever. Um, and so that's been, that's something that we're, you know, hyper-focused on now is like really solving the UX in a way that's not, you know, not telling, not having to educate everyone, what, what is a channel, what is liquidity, what do you need to do, and more just solving that so that you can just start using it instead of understanding then using it, you can just jump right in. So these, this particular subset of clients may have this inclination, like, all right, maybe we need to adopt this because it's better. Do you, do you see them get more resolve after they've set up with you they've accepted some payments and they've realized they're like holy shit this is actually really uh really profound like maybe i should be digging more into this yeah i mean it's yeah it's been it's been really fun working with those types of people because there is generally an aha moment of like wow like the i think the biggest thing that they really struggle to wrap their head around is like the settlement times of like when you make a payment and that payment says succeeded 
Like that means that it's it's done. Like it's a payment made. And they're like, well, don't like we have to wait like a couple of days to like clear it or like you know what what happens next. And it's like, no, it's done. Like that's it. And that has been, I think, the biggest uh, eye opener to a lot of those folks is like, it's it's truly instant settlement. And that's not like a marketing term. It's it's a fact. Yeah, <laughs> it, just, it does blows people. It does blow people's minds. Blows people's minds. Um, that was a part of the conversation I was having earlier with um, somebody in the mining space too. And this is something we experienced at great American mining. Uh, and this isn't even particular to the lightning network, but it was just dealing with mineral rights owners who are used to um, just letting an oil and gas company come in, extract their oil or gas, send it down market and then get a royalty check, maybe 90 to 120 days later. Mm-hmm. where yeah. we would go to them and be like, hey, you could take your gas in kind instead of sending it down pipeline, just have the the oil and gas operator on your land uh, siphon some of the gas off to this this plot of land here. We'll put mining operations here. You mine Bitcoin, you get paid out every day. And that was mind-blowing for them. They can monetize mm-hmm. their gas on site instantly and, and get those revenues and not have to wait three to six months to get those royalty checks. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And like, that's the, that sort of story applies just all over the board. Like it's really crazy. Um, just, I, I mean, it's how comfortable people have gotten with like the idea of like 60 day, you know, payment windows and things like that. And then, um, you think like, you know, Sonoda who's doing kind of like energy payments, um, via the lightning network, like that's, that's obviously a, a spot that's prime for, you know, lightning adoption. And so I'm, I'm really excited for that team and what they're building. And I think it just goes to show like, uh, one, once you kind of get in there and you show them, you don't have to wait 60 days to get this, you know, large chunk of money. You can get paid, you know, instantly and like at, a, at an interval of like every hour or something, instead of, you know, having to wait for the end of the month and then sending it like, it's just, it's, the ways that two parties can interact, it just really changes that entirely. Yeah. No need for a business like Chime anymore. It's like, give me my paycheck a couple of days early. It's like, hey, we can yeah, set yeah. up the infrastructure. We can get paid by the hour immediately if you want to. Yeah. that's. I think I had a tweet about that. It was probably a while ago, but it was... Um, I think that Lightning can like really disrupt like the payday loans industry because like you don't have to wait you know, for your check every two weeks or once a month or something, you know, you can get paid every day or something like that. And so there's just less need for those kind of predatory loans um, against people that just need money today. And so, yeah, again, another big opportunity space. Yeah. So what's exciting you right now? Oh man. Um, a lot, a lot of things like what, something that really, um, excites me inside of voltage is, uh, we're working on a lot of like LSP work. So LSP kind of means a lot of things inside of the network, but specifically on like the, the liquidity side, as we see, uh, that's a big pain point, um, for people. So if you want to set up a BTC pay server or something, um, requiring you to, Hey, you got to go shop around to get these 10 channels so then people can pay you or something like that is that's not a good UX. And so we're working on more, um, just automated liquidity. So, uh, essentially abstracting away all of like the inbound, um, issues and just being able to, um, you know, generate an invoice, send a payment. We'll make sure through like our LSP services that the payment gets there. And so I think that's going to open up a lot of doors for a lot of people. And, um, I think that, you know, no, like kind of running nodes and operating nodes was really hard. I feel like we solved that. I mean, fairly well, there's still a lot of work to do there, but I think liquidity is definitely like the next juggernaut that we got to go after in terms of really simplifying for people. So that's something we're really focused on is making the liquidity story, you know, much, much easier. And so, um, we have some things we're working on that will probably, probably be available mm-hmm. for testing at least by like this quarter. Hell yeah. And as somebody who's dealing with these liquidity issues day in and day out what are what are some of those issues like for you guys if you're trying to solve these problems for your customers what what problems are you running to and sort of that meme where you're taking on the grenades and the <laughs> yeah. And saving them yeah and they're sleeping in bed like what what are those grenades and knives for you guys yeah. So, I mean, like, so the things that we're working on, I mean, just generally speaking, just inbound in general. So like, you know, today, if you want to go stand up a BTC pay or something, you know, you have to go to Amboss or something to like buy channels or get them from Ellen Big or, you know, all some of these places where you can just buy a channel for. And you got to usually buy several to make sure that you people can pay from different areas of the network. Um, but we're kind of making like a, a liquidity service that will essentially you can, you know, use it to just generate an invoice and 
people will pay to like our well-connected node and then we'll make sure to like open up a channel to you or resolve the payment. So you can basically just forget about inbound entirely and you know, we'll just make sure that, you know, payments get there um, and we'll make sure that our node is, you know, well-connected and all that stuff. So that's, um, I think that that in of itself is like a, is a really big deal. Um, and then we're also, you know, just trying to make like outbound simpler too. So kind of getting from, you know, at the end of the day, most, most people aren't using, um, don't aren't the, the way to fund a Bitcoin channel today is you have to have Bitcoin open up a channel. You have, you know, that those stats that you can send out. Um, but usually people are like buying that Bitcoin, you know, Swan or river or whatever. And then like, you know, transferring that to their L and D node or their node in general, and then opening up channels with it. Like that's like, you know, a four step process to get there. No one's really, you know, no one is usually opening up from like cold storage or something where you already have Bitcoin. So the, it's it's a little onerous to get to the ability to send via lightning. And so that's kind of the next step is like, okay, inbound is is fairly solved. And so now we need to work on outbound of like, how do you just get sats in a lightning channel that you can go and send out? And so that goes right along with the inbound story. But um, I think that's like the logical next step. <clears throat> and well, how do you think that gets solved? Straight fiat to uh, a channel with outbound liquidity or... Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's several ways. I think that, um, so the there you obviously have to use kind of an on-off ramp to go from like dollars into Bitcoin, but then there's things like, you know, submarine swaps that you can do to like, you know, get the funds in or just, uh, you know, pay the that fiat on an off ramp could have lightning already. And so they just like kind of pay an invoice into your node. So there, there's a couple of different ways of doing that, but ultimately um, trying to reduce those steps from like, you know, four steps into like one or maybe two of like buy Bitcoin, send it to your channel um, is, is kind of like, is, is the idea there. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much to figure out. Yeah. What, uh, what else? Cause you guys have, so that's flow, right? Um, in terms of channel yeah. management stuff, what, like, what is the whole uh, spec of flow? Yeah. So full, like flow, it started out as a, uh, a wrapper on top of Lightning Labs' pool um, auction service. And so that that's what it was today. You can buy a channel really easily via pools auction service. Um, that has been okay. Um, it's it's kind of had a few issues and whatnot. And it's been a, it's a good V1 of it, but that's kind of like the V2 of flow is to uh, create more just automated LSP stuff. So it's not like necessarily buying a channel from like uh, an auction service. It's more just, hey, here's my node pub key. I want to make sure that payments get there, make it happen, and you know we do that. And so it's a much much simpler flow that not not not, not, not to be <laughs> not to be funny. <laughs> uh, it's a much simpler flow um, to that. Uh, and so um, so we're just really really revamping that. And, and ultimately, we really want to create a platform that's um, very holistic and really combining all of these things into like just a really easy experience. So you don't have to, you know, today you have your voltage node, you got to go to flow and like buy a channel and like, it's kind of a back and forth, but we want to make a more unified experience where it's just, mm -hmm. you know what, you got a node, you want to accept payments. Here you go. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. And then on top of it, yeah. And then the analytics that you guys provide on top of it, mm -hmm. is that something again, I'm, I'm a, st a, a caveman with a, our lightning node is like, we're writing scripts to like pull data yeah. from our node to give me like a daily update on all the sats that have flowed through it. And yeah. Yep. That's it, it's, it's really amazing how many people do that. Like it's almost everyone, I mean, cause there really isn't a good solution for it. Like, and so almost everyone is just kind of writing these scripts to like, you know, give them notifications of payments or just like create CSVs or whatever. And it's just like, that's, that's one of the big surprises is talking with customers is everyone um, is just doing rewriting, you know, the same tool in a different way for the same problem. And so that's kind of what we're aiming for with surge is to really um, make it, make the observability of your node um, really, really simple. And so you can just kind of plug it in and just visualize everything that's happening of, you know, your channels, your balances, all those things, but also be able to like, you know, export those into like a QuickBooks compatible CSV. So then you can go and like, you know, do, import it, you know, really, really easily. So you don't have to write these scripts over and over again. And same thing with like, you know, alerting of, Hey, did your node go offline? Did a channel get forced closed? Um, are you having a high payment failure rate? Um, and so these are all things that really exist everywhere else inside of like the tech world. And so we're just kind of bringing that same thinking into lightning. And, you know, people have been, you know, we've been, we've been demoing that with some customers and people are really excited about it because it really solves a really big need of just like, Hey, you know, 
I'm not going to use the command line to go and s export data that I'm going to go and send to my accountant every day or every week or whatever. Um, I need a tool that's going to do that for me. And, you know, that's what we're trying to solve. Yeah. Thank you for building it because <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the CSVs, emails sent from the scripts, while they're, they're helpful, it would mm -hmm. be nice to have just like a pretty UI get updated and just like have it all consolidated. Yeah. That's one thing that gives me stress is somebody running especially with podcasting 2.0 where people are just mm -hmm. fucking streaming us yeah. like one set every minute all day <laughs> yeah. every day and just like thinking about like the accounting at the end of the year gives me a migraine yeah your accountant quits like every year you gotta find a new <laughs> one that can trick into dealing with it um but yeah like that, that's the great thing about surge too is like it'll have um the ability to like give people you, you can give your accountant access to surge and they don't have access to your note or anything but they can see the balances do their own exports do all of the things so um and especially inside of like a large organization where you have like a finance team well they you just you don't want to go back and forth all the time. Just give them access to Surge. They can export all of the data that they need, see everything, um, and they never actually like have access to the node itself. And so it's it will simplify a lot of that back and forth um, between the two. And I think that that's um, it's it's a it's one of the less sexy things, but it's one of the most necessary things um, inside of like you know getting large scale companies to adopt Lightning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then one way in which you guys built voltage particularly like the technical stack of it is all the data inside the nodes you guys are operating is encrypted right so you have no access to it right yeah yeah like by default um real bedford's playing <laughs> yeah. peter mccormick's here so i think they just scored yeah it sounds like it something like that um yeah so like so yeah, the by default like the nodes that we run are basically black boxes to us so we don't you know we can't see what your channels are who your peers are with any of that data so it's all it's all a black box and um you know using uh, more tools is like all opt-in so like that's that's something um you know privacy is is a big deal and so uh by default all of the nodes are essentially just you know black boxes yeah which is massive um and yeah so what do you what do, what are you seeing in terms of like uh, not new developments in the space? We've covered that, but like uh, competition or um, sort of new types of companies that are maybe getting more specialized in lightning service provider or the analytics side of things. How are, how are you seeing the landscape of mm -hmm. um, more people coming to this lightning network service provider space? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 gotten interesting over the last couple of years. And I think that um, there's, yeah, there, there's a lot of people that are kind of um, solving different things in different ways. And that goes back to like kind of the, uh, when I think about these things, I re you really got to focus on taking more of a, an objective view of, you know, just understanding what the user needs, how to best solve that. And I think that, um, you know, I think that we're on the path to do that. And I think that there's a lot of um, other like, you know, unique uh, companies that are creating. I think that, uh, I mean, Amboss like didn't exist, you know, uh, when I started Voltage and like, you know, that's a great um, company that kind of specializes in visualizing network data and things like that. Um, so like those types of companies are, are very, very interesting. And then uh, I think that there's a lot uh, of people just apply, applying the technology in just new ways, which is super exciting. And so ultimately, like, you know, there's there's more custodial services that have popped up. Like, and again, this is it. It's crazy to think about, you know, two years ago, but like there wasn't, you know, the El Salvador announcement, like the Chivo wallet and all of those things weren't there, you know, at mm -hmm. the time. And so thinking about, you know, all the things that have popped up since then of, you know, a lot of custodial services, which is um, which is fine. I think that, you know, when Chi when El Salvador adopted it, really the only path forward was custodial. And that's, you know, the way that most El Salvadorians used it. Um, and, you know, that's that's fine. Like, you know, let's just let's get the adoption rolling. But that's, again, kind of going back to where we want to focus on is um, giving similar experiences in a non-custodial fashion is, is certainly important. And um, so, yeah, so there's been there's been a lot of uh, innovation happening that enable new experiences, new things to be built. Like I mentioned Mutiny earlier, you know, shouting out to that again of, you know, building some kind of like privacy centric like wallet was not possible like back, you know, back two years ago. And so. Um, with a lot of those opportunities, I think that there's a lot of, and like Sensei, like uh, there, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. John uh, Cantrell's like uh, implementation on top of LDK. Uh, there's just, there's a lot more opportunity to do new and unique things. Um, and so, you know, we pay close attention to what's possible and, you know, where does, 
what tool can solve the user's problems in the best way at the right time. Yeah. And I know you're pragmatic and objective, just dealing with what's in front of you right now, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what yeah. are you looking forward to or what would you like to see built that would help you out and what you're doing? That's a good, that's a good question. I think that, um, I mean, the things that's like what a big initiative that we're kind of working on right now is um, kind of decentralizing ourselves. And so we're working on getting into like more cloud providers. We're working on standing up our own data center here in Austin. Hell yeah. Um, so yeah, being able to do more of that. And so I think that um, that has, there's a lot of tools out there for that, but they're like, I think doing it in a very Bitcoin centric way is like less, there's not, there's not a lot for that. And so um, that's some things that we've had to kind of like take on ourselves. And so I think that more, uh, more things that help us run our infrastructure, which is maybe a, it may be a lame answer, but like, I think that, you know, as we look to decentralize ourselves, um, looking at services that kind of help with that story. And, and that's something that I'm really excited about for this year is looking into, you know, doing more, like there's, there's a lot more out there than just Bitcoin and lightning. We're going to start playing with some of those things like, you know, like, like, uh, like Explora and like some of those like block Explorer technology or, um, just even more just, um, general, um, maybe not Bitcoin centric things, but just more general, um, privacy tooling or things like that. So there's a lot out there. And I think that making those things more, you know, digestible and helpful or usable would be, would be great for us. Yeah. I don't think that was a lame answer. That's the thing. Good. Hardware is not pretty. For some reason, hardware uh, turns people off. But I think, mm -hmm. I think we're trying, especially in a Bitcoin standard, where the protection of private public key pairs via hardware and the operation of nodes via hardware, uh, Bitcoiners should be very in tune with the landscape of different hardware options and what's going on because it's going to be incredibly important. This is a yeah. hardware revolution just as much as it is a software revolution. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. I, I definitely agree. And I think that that's what, what I love about Bitcoin in general from more of a philosophical level is that you, you have the ejectability of anything. Like you can, you can start on voltage and you can transition to running your own node. You can vice versa. Like you can, you can really pick and choose what tool you want to use when and where, and you have the ability to com be as completely self-sovereign as you want to and do all the things yourself. Use a block stream satellite to broadcast. You could do all of it. Or if you want to do, you know, go hundred percent custodial, you can do that. And so as, Bitcoin in general, you have the optionality to choose what level you want to have trust, not have trust and all those things. And that's that's a big deal. And that's not possible anywhere else. And that's one that's something that just gets me excited about Bitcoin in general. Yeah. Speaking about Bitcoin generally, how are you feeling about the state of the overall network? What are your thoughts on Bitcoin and its position considering this global macroeconomic back backdrop? Mm -hmm potential to go into a massive recession, potential <laughs> depression. What are your thoughts on like the state of Bitcoin generally adoption, whatever it may be, it's narrative. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I'm optimistic. Um, and maybe I'm just generally an optimist, but I think that I'm really optimistic. And I am, I am for several reasons of like, we've seen this last year has been a shit show of just problem after problem in the DeFi crypto space, but nonetheless, Bitcoin is looped into those, you know, not by our choosing, but we are. And it's still, the price hasn't really fallen anymore. You know, it came down initially, but FTX crashed. Bitcoin hasn't really moved. You know, Celsius crashed. Bitcoin didn't really move. And so I do feel positively about that and, you know, looking forward into what can happen for Bitcoin specifically. And then I also think, I mean, the, it, it's the typical saying of, you know, the bear markets for building. And so I think sure. that, um, I think that that's one of the great things of, you know, when Bitcoin was at 60 K, I think, uh, everyone was really starry eyed and, you know, it's, it's just classic, you know, I've been through so many of these cycles, you just see it over and over again. And so I'm, I'm, I'm okay being at where we're at. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to build some really great things. And then, um, I'm super excited for the next bull cycle when we're, you know, more positioned from a tech tech perspective, um, to really take advantage of a lot of those, a lot of those things. So, um, ultimately, and then, you know, global macro is, I just, I don't think too terribly much about it. You know, you just, I just kind of roll with it from that perspective, but I think Bitcoin generally really excited about it, really excited about where we're at. And I think that, you know, like I mentioned earlier about these customers coming to us, like there's still people coming to us that are, um, you know, outside the Bitcoin space that want to use this technology and adopt it. And so I think that over the last year we've seen, 
I think every bull and bear cycle, we see a divergence of Bitcoin from crypto. And every year, um, crypto, key, like, you know, ICOs, and then, you know, that all crashed, like, you know, NFTs and like all of these, like, you know, big giant exchanges that are, you know, committing fraud. And so I think um, ultimately we're separating ourselves. And I think that people are really realizing that um, over and over again. And so that's also, I would call it a positive of the last. Definitely. Six months of this silver lining. At least. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so I think that's a really good, um, it sucks because people got hurt in Celsius and FTX and like, you know, they lost money and all those things. And like, you know, that's a horrible thing, but, um, the sooner we can get rid of these bad people, the better. Yeah. Rip the bandaid off. Yeah. Get them out. Sorry, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'm yeah. Interested to see how that one plays out. <laughs> but then, uh, I mean, Bitcoin more generally, but now Voltage and you being a founder and somebody who's in charge of this business, how mm -hmm. how do you approach the prospect of a prolonged bear market, managing your team, managing your, your balance sheet, your company? How's yeah? How's uh, how's your perspective going into 2023? I mean, I, I, again, I, I'm optimistic. I think that um, there the, the last several years in kind of... Um, in the VC world and operating company and everything were just, were maybe abnormal. And so I think people got really used to the abnormality. And I think that we're maybe today in an overcorrective cycle and then we're gonna like level out into like a more standard um, normal operating um, capacity there. But I think, you know, generally speaking, Voltage holds Bitcoin on its balance sheet. You know, we're gonna be using it for liquidity and like all of these things. So like we're, you know, we've never stopped allocating to Bitcoin even during these, you know, down markets. And, you know, we're, we are optimistic for what we can do and what we're doing. So like ultimately um, outlook hasn't really changed in terms of, you know, what we can do our team and all of those things. And so we have a really incredible team that we've been really fortunate, you know, to have. And so overall I'm really optimistic and I think it just goes back to, you know, bear markets are for building and we're just, we're going to do that. We're going to like just really double down on uh, building things out and, um, yeah. And then I think that, you know, we'll, we'll be able to like, you know, weather the storm and, you know, get to, get to where we need to be at the end. And I think that, you know, for those out there that are, um, maybe interested in starting, you know, Bitcoin companies or projects or anything like that. I mean, I think still do it. Um, and just under, I, I, I think maybe there's just understand kind of the, the nuances of like the differences and like, you know, it used to be anyone could get a chunk of money to go get to go and start something and maybe you need to have a little bit more of a pragmatic approach and really understand you know the problem solution and, and those types of things and so i think it is a little bit of a different environment for sure but i think that you know us as voltage were we're excited for the opportunity to go and build in, in this kind of in scenario and i think that um, i think there's a lot more people that are like us out there yeah bear markets are for building yeah it's not just i mean it is cliche but <laughs> it's true. It is funny. It huh? is true. I, I I really hate the amount of cliche like sayings and terms we have in Bitcoin, but like that I, that one is definitely true. Yeah, I mean because you get the bull markets and then you get the shitcoin distraction, and it is true. I mean, you, I've talked to Matt Corallo about this. Even like the core mm -hmm. developers working at the protocol level, when the price is ripping. It's hard to focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's yeah. There's um, it's just a lot of uh a lot of noise, you know, amongst it all. And it's, uh, and then you, you think about like all of the conferences and things like that. It's everyone's, um, yeah, just ever just so focused on like price and like all of these things and no one's, you know, in these times we're more fo focused on like the tech and yeah. that, that's, that's what I like. Yeah. Same. And we were touching on it before we hit record, but conference fatigue is real. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I feel like there's one every week now. I know. I mean, it was like, it feels like after COVID, like everyone's like, everyone's going to start a conference. Everyone's going to put on a conference. And, um, you know, we, we as a company have really had to take a step back and just really evaluate, okay, what's, what's the most important one? Let's divide and conquer. Everyone go to a different one or something like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's exciting. A lot of opportunity to do, you know, fun things, but it's also, it, it's tiring. Yeah. Towards the end of last year, I was probably at like my six or seven conference. I was like, it's all the same people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, obviously there's, there's different overlap and stuff like that. Obviously conferences, um, very bullish on conferences popping up in different parts of the world. 
Mm-hmm. But here in the U.S., it's like a caravan of Bitcoiners just go from city to city. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that that's where a lot of um, opportunity is in kind of the international space, where you know, just new conferences are reinvigorating old ones, um, which is really exciting. I mean, I think that that's um, a lot of opportunity there for more international conferences. Yeah, and I'd be interested to hear your perspective on this, considering uh, leaning into. Uh, different parts of the world, particularly emerging markets. Mm-hmm. Like that's been one of the theses behind the scenes is the emerging markets will really drive uh, a good material portion of lightning network adoption mm-hmm. uh, as we move forward. Cause it's desperately needed the utility uh, mm-hmm. of that final instant settlement, the ability to send smaller amounts of money. Um, mm-hmm. Are you seeing that confirmed at all from your perspective at voltage? Yeah, I mean, we, we are, we definitely are. And we're, you know, we're talking, we talk with a lot of, um, you know, developing countries or people that are building for that kind of market. And so um, we definitely do see that. And I think that there's uh, still a lot of opportunity to go. I think that, you know, Africa has been over the last year has been really um, a, a bustling uh, area to, to be, uh, to that are both working on lightning as far as like development talent goes, as well as, um, you know, just the usage and people um, actually adopting the technology as well. So uh, I do, I do see that and i do see that as um a way uh for us to really scale and then we something we haven't even touched on is like taro and like all of that I was stuff just about to mention yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean like so uh yeah i mean it, it's really interesting like i i am bullish on that i think that um you know it's a very people have a lot of different opinions on it of like you know bringing um kind of a more regulated uh instrument into the bitcoin space um i think there's positives and negatives to that but i think ultimately like people do um the the one of the biggest things that we hear is the volatility risk when um integrating lightning of like hey you got to hold bitcoin in these channels you know bitcoin's volatile and they don't necessarily like that so i think that being able to have a solution for that you know more natively um is exciting and i think that you know you can kind of enter and exit uh, Bitcoin into like fiat on and off ramps like Strike or any of those services, um, but ultimately you lose a lot of the benefits of Bitcoin in in those on and off ramps with like you know the transaction fees and all those things. So having a more native way to do that is exciting, and I do think that it is uh, definitely going to be popular in these kind of like third world countries or like developing countries or anything like that. And so um, I am bullish on it. I think that. Um, really interested to see how the rest of kind of the development goes with it. But I think generally speaking, like uh, I see it as a big Trojan horse into getting people um, comfortable with kind of the network and how things operate. And, you know, maybe, maybe one day the stable coins aren't needed anymore. And now we're fully Bitcoin. And this is like that, that step to get there. Yeah. The SAT standard. Yeah. And then you have things like Fediments that mm-hmm. are coming to the floor too, which I think, create the possibility to create stable coins going over the lightning network as well that'll be i'm really excited to see what the open source fediman project does what feddy does on top mm-hmm. of that as we head into uh 2023 because i i'm excited for that too and it all comes yeah. with trade-offs again it'll be people like uh fediments are custodial yeah. options like you're you're not a bitcoiner but uh, <laughs> yeah. sue me sue me it's extremely fascinating to me yeah i mean i i agree i think it's, it's all super fascinating and that's what's um been really eye-opening too is just the amount of um other layer twos like that you know that are possible with like you know i would call fediment like a layer two or you know there's lightning there's liquid there's all these other things um there's coin pools which i don't know if that's gotten much traction but there's a lot of different opportunities to scale bitcoin and you know, i think that they can all coexist too they can all you know it just depends on what you want to do and how you want to do it um yeah Fetty is is really interesting we're you know we're talking with that team on like you know is there services that we can do with that you know to help people set up Fetty mints and things like that so that'll be really interesting over the next year to see how that technology plays out so i, I do agree with you yeah and then you mentioned like ai earlier or well, you were talking about like server rack space and doing other mm. things that's another thing I think, because I've been experimenting with it. I've been experimenting with Mid Journey specifically to create thumbnails mm-hmm. for the bent, and I can tell there's a lot of GPU compute on the back end just for how how long it's beginning to take uh-huh. to to produce the thumbnail compared to where it was a couple months ago when I first started using. You tell there's increased demand, and so they're definitely having server pressure on the back end, and I think Mash and mash uh demoed this using replit they spun up like an ai mm-hmm. gener or an ai 
uh, picture generator that was payable in sats over the lightning network and so in terms of like untapping that potential if you think hey i, I mean i've been using it i think it's useful for me particularly the, the image generation stuff yeah and i would love if it were able to be faster in the way it became faster so i was just able to um help support the the server infrastructure on the back end by paying it immediately and directly yeah i mean i think that I think that theme that you're talking about there is it goes down to like value for value, right? And like that yeah. whole thing of like, uh, and I, I see that as a, a, an enormous opportunity of you know who if if they made you enter in a credit card and like you know charge you a dollar every time you did an image generation, you know you might be less uh, less eager to use that. And but if you you know uh, integrate a lightning voice or show a lightning invoice that is maybe you know integrated with like your web browser or something and just it just pays it, you know you're it's a better experience and you're more willing to even contribute to them for that, you know, server infrastructure and doing those things. So I think that, I mean, value for value has always been exciting to me. And I think that it's, uh, has so much use just everywhere. And, um, and shout out to Adam Curry for kind of um, championing that in the early days. And I think that, um, we see that being able to be applied to so many different things. And I think that that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. That's gotta be Matt. When you think about like lightning network enabled API calls, Mm -hmm. Again, going yeah. back to like these sub networks and the amount of traffic, like I don't think people fathom the amount of traffic that will be going over the Lightning Network if we do go to this value for value model, or whether it's you free streaming us sats for the podcast or somebody pinging uh, an AI image generator API mm -hmm. and having to pay for that, and then you add in things uh, like Sonoda, like paying for electricity mm -hmm. on the go, and then we can't even imagine what else is going to be built and just the amount of sats flows that are going to be happening once this finally takes off is going to be unfathomable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think, um, and I think it's, it's already, it's already happening to like, again, comparing to two years ago, there wasn't a lot of companies building for these things. Their value for value wasn't a th like podcasting 2.0 wasn't a thing yeah, it was kind of on the cusp, um, and yet we didn't have Mash, we didn't have we didn't have all of these companies that are kind of building in it, and so um, I think that we're yeah we're on that cusp of like you know there's real you know real people, real companies that are optimizing for these solutions, and so it's gonna be really exciting to see what comes out of it. Yeah, in terms of like the different types of wallets, obviously we have mobile wallets, you have browser extension wallets like Albi, you have more custodial wallets like Mash. Blue mm -hmm. wallet, whatever maybe. How do you think this evolves? Like, um, how do you think people interact with the Lightning Network predominantly moving forward? Is it browser extension? Is it mobile first? I think yeah. I mean that's a good question. I I don't know if I have a great answer to it. I think that there's a lot of opportunity to do. I mean multiple things. I think that um, it maybe it's you maybe it's all of the above of like maybe it's we can create an integrated experience across all of these different things and you just you know you can use it in these different scenarios or um, or you just you know, have separate balances or um, you know segment them out or something like that and so I think that there's a lot of opportunity and see how those things play out but I think ultimately um, people will want to use lightning in all of those contexts you know mobile and like in the web and all of these different things and I think that uh, I think that the more the more native of an experience we can make, the better. And so I think that that's, I think there's, I don't know if I have a direct answer of like the way that I think it'll go. I think it'll be um, really interested to see kind of just what the users decide and what, what ultimately they want. And I think uh, unifying those experiences is going to be probably a direction a lot of people move. Yeah. It's dope. So early freaks. Yeah. If you want to come build, leave your mark again. Come build over here. So, where do you want Voltage to go over the next 2023? What's your one year, three year, five year plan for Voltage? I know <laughs> yeah. you're pragmatic, you're objective, you think about what's important, <laughs> but you have to have some grander scheme of, of how you see this playing out. Yeah, I mean, I we, we, we really want to create just an experience inside of Lightning that is just, um, that's not weird. Like when you th when you think about comparing using Lightning to using Gmail or something, there's a there's an obvious difference in the user experiences, the flows, and everything like that. And so we're trying to create an experience that is a Gmail, right? And but again, non custodially. And so that's the really challenging part. You can do that kind of custodially today, but like that's not exciting to me. Like we need 
the ability for a user to like own own the full uh, like the full access to their funds. Um, and so uh, so that's kind of like our north star. That's where we're driving to is to make an experience that is not abnormal. Um, and in ultimately like letting letting users or companies or anything kind of choose what points they want to hit. And that's kind of the way that I'm, I'm building out voltage is um, having a set of services and like, you know, they all combine really, really nicely to a really simple experience. But if you wanted to just use, you know, the LSP or you just wanted to use surge or any of these pieces, you can do that too. And so we're really just trying to solve um, the problems inside of lightning to enable it to scale like into, you know, a, to 10x, 100x, whatever the number is, and um, and there's still an insane amount of work to be done to to get to that point. So, um, you know, there's lot lot to lot to happen over the next you know several years, and that's what you know my my theme for this year is just really to ship more products. So we really want to just start hammering, getting a lot of things out there and uh, a lot of new things um, to to help people. And so uh, so yeah, I think ultimately you know what we're trying to do is create a service that is just dead simple to use and can scale to, you know, any, any level that you would, that you would want inside of lightning, um, but still give people the optionality to, you know, to pick and choose what levels they, they enter into. And so big grandiose plan, um, lots to do to make that happen. And, you know, we're, we're working towards it. Yeah. And I guess last question before we wrap up here, because you mentioned building in the bear to prepare for, uh, the next bull market, if it comes, probably will come. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with that in mind, so you, 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 with every bull market comes another bigger wave of adoption. Mm-hmm. How do you prioritize uh, what you guys build and work on and focus on at Voltage with that in mind? Like with that lingering thought, all right, when the bull comes, there's going to be an onslaught of adoption like we haven't experienced in the past. Here's what we need to prioritize, be ready for that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think um, a, a lot of it comes from, I think, I mean, we luckily we've learned a lot, I mean, from operating for, for a couple of years and just seeing kind of the operating in the last bull market of kind of what's necessary. And so um, I think that what, what, we, what we really think about is, I think it goes back to just making it not weird. It's like when someone, you know, is trying to, you know, we we're trying to onboard Walmart or something and they, we, we have to explain channels to them or like, you know, where, like, what does a node do? How does it work? Like those things are like, I think that the more that we can um, make it a normal experience, the better. And I think that when we think about the next bull market and bull cycle, I think that um, we're going to see an increase of people looking at lightning and if we're still at the point where we have to explain all of these things and we have to, you know, we have to educate them on how to manage their channels and do all of these things, like they're going to leave and they're, they're, you know, they're not going to ultimately come to lightning and Bitcoin and all of these things. And so we need to be prepared. For, I think ultimately, I think that boils down to user experience. I think That's the user experience yeah. needs to be at a level that is ready for new people to enter because right now we're onboarding existing bitcoiners that's great that's fine but like next bull cycle we're going to be getting looked at from people that aren't as you know bitcoin native and or have their you know multi-sig set up like at home and all those things and so we need to have a user experience that can satisfy those people and that is going to unlock you know the next level for lightning yeah i was going to say it sounds like it's more UX oriented than infrastructure yeah. oriented. Yeah, I would say, I mean, they kind of go hand in hand, um, mm. but ultimately like what we want to present, what we want to do is, is a lot of UX improvements. And I think how we solve that is infrastructure related, mm. but the thing that we want to surface is the UX improvement. Yeah. Whew. I'm excited for you guys. Yeah. Except yeah, for thanks. Bitcoin. Yeah. Oh, me too, man. I think that there's a lot to happen. A lot, lot of things happening um, across the space. And I'm just, I'm super excited. I'm as well. I'm happy you pinged me. Yeah. Let me know you're going to be in town. I'm happy you came to town and we were able yeah. to do this. Yeah. I'm glad, glad we could do it. Glad I got to stop by and um, yeah, love visiting Austin. Yeah. We shouldn't wait two years for the next one. We got yeah. to <laughs> get into this more often. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to do something with Odell sometime too. Yes. He'll be, uh, we'll have to figure out when we're all in town. Yeah. Something yeah. like either Nashville here, wherever. Yep. We yep. find ourselves at the same spot. Um, any final parting notes for the freaks out there? 
Um, I mean, just keep building. Like, I think uh, what I always like to have as a call to action is, uh, you know, if you haven't messed with, played with lightning at all yet, do it. Like, there's always kind of, you know, everyone falls down this Bitcoin rabbit hole. You learn about, you know, Bitcoin, the technology, the sound money, all those things. Lightning is just kind of like the next rabbit hole, of like diving down into what is possible inside of that. And so if you haven't done that yet, definitely do it. Even if it's just like a custodial wallet, moon wallet, or wallet of Satoshi, any of those things, just start playing with it, figure out what's possible and what you can do with it. Um, and then that's going to lead, you know, you down this journey of kind of what is what is the next phase of Bitcoin going to be like? And then similar call to action side of like builders. Just if you are interested in contributing to Bitcoin um, in, in any capacity, even if it's, you know, developer, non-developer, um, full-time, part-time, anything, like definitely just get your hands dirty. And uh, I think it's very rewarding for one. And then two, um, it's very likely going to lead to something bigger, you know, uh, in, in the end. So, um, you know, definitely encourage everyone to get involved in one way, shape or form. Yeah. This may come off as a bit uncouth, but I do think the Bitcoin industry is about to be the, or be the beneficiary of a positive externality, a silver lining of an impending recession that particularly affects the tech industry, which is going to have a lot of good developer talent, which is getting laid off from there. Silicon yeah. Valley tech jobs are like, all right, I'm sure there's a bunch of orange pill people who are in these companies who've been thinking about it and may not have had the courage to take the leap, but now it may be forced yeah. to. Yeah, Coinbase uh, laid off a thousand people today. Today? Today. I didn't catch that. Today, yeah, it was a new, new round of layoffs at Coinbase. So yeah, anyone that's, um, you know, feeling the effects of that, like definitely kind of explore the space and, um, you know, we, we welcome you in the Bitcoin land. Come, come build. It's still early. Oh, yeah. Bram. Still so much to build. It's always a pleasure, sir. Yeah, thank you, Marty. It's been fun. Thank you for crushing it. Where can we find out more about you, Voltage, or should we send the freaks? Yeah, good question. So I'm on Twitter, um, at G Krizek, G-K-R-I-Z-E-K. Uh, Voltage, our website is voltage.cloud. Twitter is voltage underscore cloud. Um, so yeah, just reach out, DM me, DMs open. Um, happy to help anyone out in any way we can. Building on Lightning, working in Lightning, any of those things. I mean, my, I have an open door. We'll link to all that in the show notes, freaks. Hope you enjoyed this rip. Peace and love.